This is CBC Here and Now. We're currently uh, investigating the death of a 36-year-old woman uh, who was found in CBS. Police are calling the CBS death suspicious, and tonight they're looking for witnesses. Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. I'm Carolyn Stokes. We begin tonight with a story we're tracking out of Conception Bay South. The RNC is pleading for information following the death of a woman on Minerals Road. Here and Now's Ariana Kellant has this report from the scene. Police are now considering this scene a suspicious one. Paramedics and the RNC were called here around 1 o'clock last Thursday. They found a woman lying on the side of the road. She was injured. The 36 year old woman would later die in hospital. Those injuries were examined during an autopsy by the chief medical examiner's office, which determined her death is suspicious. Now it's the RNC's job to piece together what happened before one o'clock on that day nearly a week ago. I think it's important to say that yeah, even little bits of information is very valuable and can lead us in the right direction. Uh, of course, the area of Minerals Road is uh, very much a uh, you know, under the microscope, but uh, the surrounding areas as well, if you have dash camera or CCTV footage, uh, as well as any witnesses or people who frequent the area, you know, keep in mind that any bits of information we can uh, obtain could be very valuable for this investigation. The type of injury she sustained or how she received them has not been disclosed, nor has the RNC shed light on who this woman was. But the police are asking if someone knows something, they should come forward. Ariana Kelland, CBC News, CBS. Well, simple things like using the bathroom are not so simple for a couple living in Conception Bay North. Ed Doyle says and his wife say flooding from a brook near his home affects their sewer system and an attempt by government this summer to fix the problem was a waste of time and money. Here now, Cease Hare has their story. In Ed Doyle's house in Gull Island, Getting water is the easy part. Getting rid of it is the problem. Waste in his house doesn't flow downhill, it backs up. If I say, went in now and turn on my uh, shower, so I try to get a shower, in about two minutes I'll be standing in waste water coming back up my shower. And if we have, say, more rain than what I have now, it, within the next day or so, my system will be even higher and I would have to leave. Well, to be honest with you, like, you know, I have to use other facilities. To, to use the bathroom. And have you had to leave your house to use the bathroom? Yes, and we've had to leave our house to wash clothes and we have to, had to leave our house to take a shower. The bane of Doyle's existence is a nearby brook a few hundred feet from his house that's clogged, overgrown with enough vegetation to block the water flow, resulting in a dam. The problem started seven years ago. As a result of the flooding, the soil on Doyle's property is so soaked that his septic system is full, his waste has nowhere to go. Last year, he put in a new septic system, and that didn't work. He lobbied government to widen the brook in the flooded area, which is downstream from a highway culvert. This past June, help arrived. A contractor showed up with a crew and did some dredging on a section of the brook much further downstream. The work never touched or went near the reservoir. And as a result, Doyle's problem still isn't fixed. He's even more frustrated now because he can't afford other solutions. We're not on welfare. We're not rich. So we're in that area where we're just getting by. And we're getting no help. Meanwhile, the Department of Transportation and Work says the work done in June was meant to increase the flow of water from Doyle's property. The department has also considered more dredging, but there is a concern that changing the water table may dry out wetlands and wells upstream. What you can see here is a couple of feet of water, and Doyle says if the government doesn't fix this, he'll have to do it by himself, by hand. Cease here, Gull Island. Conception Bay North. A beautiful evening tonight. Had to be outside to enjoy uh, this summer weather, and it is certainly summer everywhere across the island. Not the story in Labrador, though, a little bit cooler today. 
Now, we are in for a little bit of a cool down as we head through the next couple of days. Don't worry, it's not going to last too long. Uh, but with that, we are looking at some rain. But I will have all those details, your full, full forecast coming up. The opportunity people were coming in saying, well, we got vet, veterans allowance. What can I do about it? Celebrating a century of Cohen's, looking back as a local business turns 100. Well, the results are in. We now know exactly what was inside barrels brought up from the depths of Deer Lake's water supply. Here now is Lindsay Bird has that story. The mystery is now solved, although there's little to show for today's big reveal. The release of a report that states that old barrels found at the bottom of the Humber Canal were full of holes, held nothing much of interest, and are harmless. We're confident with the testing that was done, as we had said earlier, uh, the drums themselves, uh, appearances, they were empty from the beginning. They were full of canal water. Uh, the sediment sampling uh, showed all limits uh, below thresholds. Uh, so the, it was very comprehensive testing that was done. So we expect that that's uh, closed with the matter. Cornerbrook Pulp and Paper's parent company, Kruger, hired environmental specialists back in June to haul up the barrels from the canal. Divers found 74 drums, dating from between the 1930s and 1950s, thought to have once been used to float wooden booms before sinking and being forgotten. The barrels were rediscovered a few years ago by a Deer Lake resident worried about water quality, since the canal supplies both the powerhouse and the town with its drinking water. But both Kruger and the town say water quality was never an issue. We are very excited today that we can announce that we've always had, and again, I'll say before, before, during, and after this uh, was done, we have had safe, clean drinking water. 17 other old barrels were found on land during the removal process, and Cornerbrook Pulp and Paper says it will be cleaning those up in the weeks ahead. The canal may no longer hold any barrels, but two sunken barges dating back to when the canal was built do remain. Cornerbrook Pulp and Paper says those aren't an environmental concern and they are staying put. Lindsay Bird, CBC News, Deer Lake. Well, the head of planning for an expansion of the Anglican Cathedral in St. John's says they're working on a new proposal. The Anglican Church withdrew its application after learning council wasn't going to approve it. There were public complaints about the design of the building. The chair of the project says they will rework that design. Well, as Hibernia continues the cleanup from its latest oil spill, the second spill in a month, groups continue to speak out about the need for independent observers in the offshore. So we're going to check in with Peter Cowan now, who's standing by with one such guest. Peter? Carolyn, I'm here with uh, Sigrid Gunemund, who is with the World Wildlife Fund, and they've taken interest in the issue of the oil spills in the offshore and especially the issue of regulating it. So you're calling for an independent safety regulator separate from the CNLOPB. Why is that? Well, uh, we feel that uh, with the Offshore Petroleum Board's uh, dual responsibility for promoting development within our offshore, but also uh, responsible for environmental health and safety, that sometimes there's uh, a bit of blurred lines, and uh, particularly when it comes to the uh, relationship between the regulator and the operator, there's often uh, not clear roles in terms of who's making the decisions um, and when and why. So we have seen in the last year a number of signif significant events in our offshore area, and we do um, have extreme weather conditions in the, on the North Atlantic, and uh, it's certainly a very challenging environment. And so there has been a number of health and safety issues within the last year, and a number of uh, environmental issues with the uh, three spills within a 10 month period. And this is across all regulators, all, um, sorry, all operators in our offshore. So, um, you know, there has been some human error, equipment error and failures. So we feel that we need an increased uh, regulatory oversight to ensure that we have those best practices in place and that we have industry per performing to the highest standard and that we have independent observers to ensure that the health and safety practices and the environmental procedures are being appropriately followed. 
Why do you think that needs to happen with a separate agency, though, as opposed to saying, why don't we just give more power or more strength to the CNLOPB? Uh, again, it comes back to this dual role of uh, promoting development, but also being responsible for environmental health and safety. And we have had a number of inquiries and reviews in terms of the Offshore Petroleum Boards, both Newfoundland and Labradors and Nova Scotia's, their ability to regulate uh, in the extreme weather conditions that is the uh, North Atlantic. And uh, so it's nothing um, new in terms of uh, the number of re recommendations that are out there to improve the performance of industry, to strengthen environmental standards and to s strengthen health and safety. But we just feel that they are not being implemented. Recommendations are not being implemented and that needs to change. Which specific recommendations are you talking about here? Well, the, in terms of environmental um, observations or monitoring, we would like to see environmental monitors on board uh, the vessels and platforms to observe whether or not environmental protocols are being followed. Uh, and at the moment we have the industry is self-reporting. And when we have a spill, uh, the industry reports on the size of the spill, how it happened, um, what the potential environmental effects are. And we see that as a weakened regulatory system when you have an industry that is self-reporting. So we want to see uh, in monitors on place, on board, um, the platforms and the vessels, and also see that separation uh, from a regulatory perspective uh, to have an independent authority to be responsible for environmental health and safety. Okay, well, thank you very much for coming and sharing your thoughts with me. Thank you so much for having me on your show. And that is Sigrid Kundemund. She is with the World Wildlife Fund. And stay tuned. Ashley is going to be here with the weather right after the break. It's a world-class trail network right in our backyard, and we owe it all to volunteers. Today, some of the East Coast Trail Association's most dedicated volunteers are being recognized with a special award. We'll bring you that story coming up.
Welcome back everyone. Time now to check in with Ashley who's outside soaking up some of that glorious sunshine. It's such a beautiful evening out there, Ashley. It certainly is a beautiful evening. So if you have any plans, make sure that they're outside tonight uh, because this weather unfortunately isn't going to last uh, through the day tomorrow. So uh, temperatures today, if we take a look, absolutely gorgeous, 26 degrees here in St. John's. And uh, we've got a number of uh, temperatures in the 20 degree range, 26 in Badger as well. Uh, Twilling Gate sitting at 21, but unfortunately those temperatures still cool up through Labrador, only reaching the teens and single digits along the coast. Now it feels a lot less humid than it did yesterday. Still feeling more like 29 in St. John's, but uh, yesterday that number was 21 degrees and 28. So certainly uh, with this westerly flow, we are seeing uh, a lot less humidity in the air. Now winds quite gusty as well, which is helping it keep quite uh, feel quite nice today. And uh, with those current winds uh, changing now more onshore up through the northeast coast, we are seeing a little bit of a drop in temperature. So now it's sitting down at uh, 14 degrees for Twilling Gate. Still nice though in St. John's 25 degrees. 23 for Corner Brook. Now, uh, with all of this dry weather that we've been talking about uh, for the last little bit, the fire risk is pretty extreme for parts of Terra Nova, and you can see uh, there is a fire ban in place, anticipating that this won't last very long because, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, the forecast is about to change, and we're going to see some rain move in. We did see a few showers just a few uh, minutes ago. Those have dissipated though up for the Northern Peninsula, but that risk will continue for the Northern Peninsula as we head through the night tonight and staying cloudy and gray uh, and rainy up through Labrador as well. By the time tomorrow morning rolls around, we will start to see some more cloud cover move in, but overnight tonight, uh, a nice evening, as I mentioned, anywhere from uh, 10 to 18 degrees for Port Bass. Those winds will eventually ease, but they are gonna pick right back up as we head through the day tomorrow. 12 degrees for Lab City is your overnight low. Nain sitting at six. Now, as far as the weather goes, as I mentioned, lots of rain on the way tomorrow. That will start for the south coast in the afternoon and then spread uh, towards the Avalon in the evening hours. And essentially the whole island will see some rain as well as up through Labrador. And as far as the amounts go by Thursday, uh, Friday morning, rather the south coast looks like it'll see the most somewhere between 20 to 30 millimeters of rain. And then look at uh, Lab West there and towards central could see upwards of about 50 millimeters of rain by the time Friday morning rolls around. So those temperature is going to be a little cooler, but we're going to return to that humid flow. That southeasterly flow will bring more of that humidity in anywhere from 20 to 24 degrees. It looks like for the Avalon Eastern Newfoundland. And then as we head towards central, a little uh, cooler up along the coast, Twilling Gate reaching a high near 19, 22 for Grand Falls, Windsor, and then uh, similar temperatures as we head towards the west coast. Cornerbrook should see a high near 23 degrees cooler for the northern peninsula only the teens uh 14 degrees for saint anthony 11 for cartwright and then single digit temperatures again for northern portions of the big land now for western and uh central new uh central labrador anywhere from 13 to 16 degrees. Those winds will be a little gusty as well between 20 to 40 kilometers per hour. So that's a look at your forecast. It is looking a little bit wet. Temperatures are gonna cool down as we head towards the weekend. We'll have all those details coming up. Carolyn. Thanks, Ashley. Well, the East Coast Trail is a big attraction in this province. And today, some of the volunteers who make it possible were recognized in a big way. 13 longtime volunteers with the East Coast Trail Association received the Sovereign's Medal bestowed by Canada's Governor General. The president of the association says it's an honor, but also an opportunity to think about the future of the trail. Here now, Zach Gowdy has more. This couple came from Quebec to spend their summer vacation on the East Coast Trail, and they are loving it. I really enjoy it. Like, so far, I think it's the most beautiful hike I did in my life. They've just begun their hike, but already they've run into volunteers. Like at Camp St. Francis, we met people that were working for the East Coast Trail, and they're like super nice. Uh, they really did like, they do this work by love, and they're super kind, and you know that they're doing this just for people that can enjoy it even more. Stories like those are what drove a small group of volunteers to start the East Coast Trail Association 25 years ago. 
Now the trail draws thousands of visitors to the province every year and is still largely maintained by volunteers. Not just in the woods, but also in the office and in the boardroom, providing every service a public body requires. The dream that the association had basically from 94 on basically is basically of a world-class uh, wilderness hiking trail on the eastern edge, edge of the Avalon. Many people thought it was impossible. And, uh, but uh, we had a determined, committed, devoted, passionate group of volunteers and we pushed through and 25 years later we're here and uh, the trail has arrived. Today, 13 of the association's most dedicated members were awarded the Governor General's Sovereign's Medal for Volunteers. Each of the recipients has given their time and expertise to the trail, but they've all gotten something back, something more than a medal. You know, most of the volunteering with the East Coast Trail is is really such a, a joy. It's it's not like work. It's not hard stuff. It's just outdoors, being with other people. And I mean, just what a glorious place we live in. I mean, what better way to showcase it than having people put on a pair of boots and just go out there and see it. Randy but while today's awards reflect how far the trail has come, Randy Murphy says we need to think about where it's headed. He wants to see provincial government policies and eventually legislation protecting the trail from development. If we don't take advantage of the opportunity that exists today, okay, to, to lay down the level of protection required, we risk basically losing sections of trail. Okay? People are coming here basically from outside of the problems. And they're coming here basically for the long hike. And, uh, and uh, we need to have it continuous and we need to have our coastline accessible. The awards are an important milestone, but for these volunteers, the hike is just beginning. Zach Gowdy, CBC News, St. John's. A staple of the Grand Falls Windsor business community celebrated a milestone anniversary this year. Count Cohen's has turned 100 years old. The store has moved four times and the business has changed over the years. But as here now, as Garrett Berry found out, the careers inside are as sturdy as ever. Picture this, a bustling Main Street with the smell of French fries, the sounds of the theater and the sight of some of the highest fashions. One of those businesses has stood the test of time, right here in Grand Falls, Windsor. You know it as a furniture store, but once upon a time, Cohen's was known for its clothing, until this man came back to the family business. Which is a good thing. <laughs> His inspiration? I'd say Confederation. <laughs> That's not an answer I was expecting. Yeah, well, uh, all the Newfoundlanders who served in the Newfoundland Regiment served overseas and were war vets. When we became part of Canada, they were given startup allowances for homes and furniture. A new market, and Cohen's took advantage. The business was comfortable with change. When the uh, rural electrification came in, we followed the routes, and we had truckloads of furniture just follow them as they connected up the lines. And if you stuck around for the ride, you've seen a lot. Obviously there's been a lot of economic changes over Newfoundland, especially in the last 25 years with the fishery. Turns out, lots have. We have two guys here in the warehouse. We have a manager. We have other managers with 30 plus years. So, But what makes this place so hard to leave? I, I don't think it's the retail part of it that uh, kept me here this long. I think it's the, uh, like I said, I, f I feel like I've almost grown up with the company, so you get familiar, you get comfortable, and uh, uh, f for me, it's, it's, it's like family. Maybe it's a culture thing. They stayed because we were honest with them. We treated them fairly, and uh, you know, a lot of people have big dreams. Uh, we didn't let anyone down, but we told them the truth. And even in retirement, there's still a draw. Boyd Cohen sold this business decades ago and left in 1994. But he's still coming back to check on his baby. Garrett Berry, CBC News, Grand Falls, Windsor. Well, it may be hard to believe, but it's almost back to school time. Now, some families, including those new to the country, while well, they struggle to afford all of these back to school supplies. Coming up, we'll speak with the Association for New Canadians about the need that they're experiencing.
Welcome back to Here and Now. Well, yes, the summer is starting to wind down, and that means it's almost back to school time. And some groups around St. John's, well, they're in need of some school supplies. And joining me now are the coordinators for the youth program for the Association of New Canadians. So, guys, can you tell me a bit about the need that you have for donations of school supplies? Mm -hmm. Uh, with the Association for New Canadian Child and Youth Program, we heavily rely on the donations sometimes that, uh, you know, throughout the year we receive lots of uh, newcomer children and youth into our uh, province where we support them to integrate in the school system where the donation plays a big role and uh, lots of community partners outside, churches and uh, folks, wonderful folks like you guys who have big hearts, uh, provide us with the support uh, which uh, we take and bring to the families when we do the first orientation and home visits. And that's, that's kind of like Christmas gift and also a welcoming package for them to be in the new country. So how many families and children do you guys work with uh, that are in need of these supplies? Well, we work with, you know, hundreds of children and families at all levels of the school system in St. John's. Um, in any one year, we might, it's hard to say exactly how many we might get, but they arrive at any time throughout the year. So the donations that we do receive around the time for the school start, they will, we will use those all throughout, you know, because as, uh, as we know, you know, uh, conflict around our world doesn't pick conveniently the first day of school, you know, yeah. to, uh, to send us some new children. Yeah, because so. you have new ca Canadians arriving in this province all year long, and that means children mm -hmm. arriving who then need to go to school, and they need the school supply. Of course. And it's not just young children. We actually, um, you know, some backpacks that are of youth sizes, or because, you know, high school kids can be a little mm -hmm. bit bigger, that always <laughs> helps too, as well. Mm -hmm. What kind of a difference does it make for a family to receive one of these, or for some of the families, I'm sure with multiple children, uh, a few of these, what kind of a difference does it make to their lives? It makes a massive difference. I mean, of course, the financial need is there. Everybody knows about that. But just that gesture of providing something that's needed, you know, it helps a family who maybe came from a difficult background really feel welcome here and not having to worry about, oh, well, what am I going to need in this school system? Because a lot of school systems in other cultures and other countries, maybe it's a little different. Maybe the school supplies is, are not the same. So it really does, it really helps a tremendous amount, both financially, but in other areas as well. And some of these families can have multiple children, uh, which, you know, that expense can really add up if you have more than one or two or three or four sure. children. Absolutely. Uh, we work with large number of families, let's say, the most families, uh, most number of children I've worked in the same family would be eight. So, you know, having to afford for eight children and also support your family in the meantime uh, would be a little bit challenging. And uh, I, from the similar background coming as one of the refugees here, I can understand that how much of support and uh, exciting it would be for the family to receive this kind of welcoming gestures. Mm -hmm. And so how can people donate and what exactly are you looking for? Well, you can reach us by looking up the Association for New Canadians online and accessing our website. We are uh, members of the Child and Youth Programs, also known as the Swiss Team, Settlement Workers in Schools. So all of our office contacts are on that website. And you also might find some reports of the other great things that we're doing for other demographics in our beautiful province as well. Mm -hmm. um, so we're looking for backpacks. We're mm -hmm. looking for exercise books, binders, even water bottles pencils, pens, markers, glue sticks, scissors, anything you can think of, calculators, all sorts of things. Absolutely. So every bit helps. And we don't usually turn stuff away. So. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we would like to take everything we could. And, uh, you know, it doesn't have to be very expensive, fancy, or, you know, something that has to be brand on it. Uh, anything you can uh, help to support our program, that would be more than appreciated. Yeah. Well, good luck with it. Thank you so much for talking to us. Oh, well, thank you for giving thank us Thank you, this CBC. We really appreciate <laughs> it. Finances can be a struggle for people from lots of different backgrounds, and the latest statistics show it's an increasing problem in this province. The number of insolvencies is up 22% over the last year, and in fact, it's growing faster in this province than it is anywhere else in the country. 
So what's leading that? Well, I've got a trustee in bankruptcy here with me, Sean Stack. A lot of those people walk through your office. Were you surprised when you saw these numbers about just how much we're seeing more and more people looking for help? Uh, no, I wouldn't say I was surprised. Uh, it's concerning and you don't want to see that many people struggling that much. And the fact that we've had these conversations in past years and we're still talking about these ra high rates of increases, definitely an issue. So what is driving this? What are sort of the common problems that you're seeing that, that people got themselves into that mean that they need to look towards either bankruptcy or a consumer proposal? Uh, good question. There's all kinds of issues that people are experiencing. We, we're still seeing uh, the, the downturn in the big projects in Newfoundland and Labrador's economy. Alberta hasn't bounced back to help offset that like some might have hoped. Uh, in uh, St. John's and the rest of Newfoundland, we're seeing that the housing market is really impacting it as well because there's fewer houses being built, which means there's fewer construction and contracting jobs, and the prices of houses have come down quite a bit as well. So talk to me a little bit about that. How does that normally fit in? Because I guess in the past, housing prices were going up a lot, and if you owned a house, you could always borrow more money out of that in case you got yourself into trouble. How's that changed now? Well, I think people, it's been said, I saw an article today saying people were using their houses as ATMs. And it's not far from the truth, because what people would do is they'd go and they'd refinance their house when their mortgage is up, and they would add money to it and pay off their credit cards and pay off their line of credit. They might add $40,000 to the mortgage, or they'd get a second mortgage taking the equity out of their house to pay off their consumer debt. But now, with pr housing prices having come down, that equity isn't there. They can't access and tap into that on their new mortgage renewal. Maybe five years ago they did it. They kept spending at the same rate, building up their consumer debt, and now they don't have that option. And they're finding out that instead of there being equity there to deal with their consumer debt, they actually might be even underwater from the refinance they did five years ago. So their house is actually worth less today than what it is they owe on it. For, for some people that I'm seeing, yes. Yeah. And so I guess, is there a way out of this? Is, is there a lesson to be learned for people who don't want to end up in your office? Uh, budgeting is crucial. Understanding what income you have coming in now and what income you expect to have coming in down the road. So if you're seasonal or if you're contract, how long is that going to last and when do you think you'll be on EI? How long do you think you might be on EI? Because you need to plan for those months where you're on EI and you have the lower income. And then just general budgeting and spending within your means. Uh, and do you expect is this going to level out at some point because as you said we've talked about this before it always you know the number of people seem to be increasing and increasing I, I certainly hope it levels out and even starts coming down I'd like to have a good news interview with you someday uh, unfortunately I don't know what the mechanism will be to start the reversal of the trend though uh, next thing we'll have increases in electricity rates and what impact that will have on the economy and I hope that that doesn't spike it even further it's hard to say at this point well, thank you very much for sharing your perspective on this. Thanks for having me. Younger generation, they like looking at the cars, but they don't have the stories these people have. It's just amazing listening to them. Well, I'm 82 now. I bring back some memories from years back. A walk down memory lane for residents of a Cape Breton retirement home. An antique car club brings the cars to them.
Welcome back to Here and Now. A mink farm in Cavendish is taking another run at the beef business. Viking Fur's plan for a local beef operation is undergoing an environmental assessment. And the company got its starting guidelines from government this week. Odor Owner Peter Knorr says the plan would help government reach its target of increasing food self-sustainability by 2023. He plans on using cattle like these belted Galloway cows. The proposed Cavendish beef farm aims to have 100 cattle and provide local beef to the area. Now, if approved, the operation would be complementary to the existing mink farm, which has been criticized before due to the smell. Nor says he understands concerns over smell, but says the cows won't add to the existing odor caused by the minks. Well, a PEI company has created a new fishing bait that it hopes will someday replace traditional bait like herring and mackerel. They're testing it out on PEI lobster and crab boats and hope to start selling it commercially soon. Nancy Russell has the story. It doesn't have a name yet, but this is the new bait, developed with help from staff at the BioFood Tech Center. It's a mix of fish, fish parts, and a special blend of oils packed into an organic casing made of banana peels and a few other secret ingredients. Yeah, it took a lot of attempts, but uh, now I think we're uh, pretty close to having a finalized recipe. It's kind of a secret formula. We'll just keep it at that for now, I guess. Prevo has fished for years, including for mackerel and herring, the traditional bait used in PEI's lobster fishery, but says those are now harder to find and expensive. It was the, uh, the cost and, and the waste, the short amount of time I spent fishing mackerel and herring. It was uh, how much was wasted, you know, and, um, and how hard it was to catch. And, and with the new quotas coming out, uh, how much more expensive it's going to be. Bait Masters says their product is more sustainable because each of the sausages, as they call them, contains the equivalent of half a fish. They tested the bait in the spring lobster fishery with observers on board collecting data to see how their bait stacks up. They haven't set a price yet for the new bait, but say it will be similar to the cost of mackerel and herring. The bottom line will be how well the catches compare. If it fishes, number one, if it fishes better or the same, it, it'll sell. It, it'll be no problem convinced. And the easy thing is, as fishermen watch each other, if He's using these and he's coming in with a few more lobster. Well, then they're, they're sold. The company has some investors, including fishermen, and it's in talks with provincial and federal funders as well. The goal is to ramp up production even more from 10,000 units this year to 300,000, ready to sell commercially in 2020. Nancy Russell, CBC News, Charlottetown. In Cape Breton, the Antique and Customer Car Club is celebrating its 40th anniversary. To celebrate, some of the members and their cars stop by a nursing home in Glace Bay to give the seniors a blast from the past. Gary Mansfield has the story. As a yellow 1937 Ford Coupe rolls up to the nursing home in Glace Bay, seniors wait outside excited as the antiques arrive. It's very nice to see them. It's a treat to see those cars here at Victoria Haven. Bill Cook is the first to grab his cane and take a look at the vintage cars. He says the antiques bring back a lot of wonderful memories. Well, I'm 82 now. I bring back some memories from years back. <laughs> Lots of fun. Oh, it's fun is right. But it's just out of this world uh, to, to uh, see the people smile and enjoy uh, uh, the uh, cars and trucks. Car Club President Bill Corbett says it's the fourth year they have visited the nursing home. Steve McIsaac, the owner of a 1947 Ford Super Deluxe, says it's heartwarming to show it off to the seniors. The younger generation, they like looking at the cars, but they don't have the stories these people have. It's just amazing listening to them. And just to see them out of that home, you know, and walking around the cars. And I allow anyone to sit in the car. They could take it for a drive if they wanted to. <laughs> the Antique Car Club holds about 42 public events each year from a 37 Ford Coupe to a 65 Mustang and everything in between. Corbett says when you travel down memory lane, everyone has a story. I love driving in them. When you see these vehicles, what kind of memories do you have? Oh, I used to have 
a shame like that. The thing is, uh, we've all been to the drive-in at one time or another. I bet you there's some stories from, about that from the cars. Gary Mansfield, CBC News, Glace Bay. Welcome back to Here and Now. Ashley is standing by with the weather forecast. And Ashley, it's definitely uh, blue skies and sunshine out there tonight. But that's going to change tomorrow, right? I think we're having a sun. lot of rain, depending is. on where you are. <laughs> depending on where you are across the province. Uh, we'll take a look at those numbers. I don't know if you heard what I just said, but uh, we're going to take a look at the rainfall numbers for tomorrow. Uh, we're looking at the... For most areas and uh, as much as 20 to 30 millimeters of rain for the south coast and then uh, here in the metro area between a trace to about 10 millimeters of rain as possible. The most amount of rain will actually be for Lab West and Central where we could see as much as 30 to 50 millimeters. Now with this it will feel a little bit more humid as well tomorrow. Temperatures a little cooler ranging from 19 to 24 degrees a little cooler up through the northern peninsula in the teens through tomorrow and then similar temperatures to what we saw today up through Labrador. Now, uh, as far as what's going to happen through the day on Friday, this unsettled pattern continues with a number of systems moving through over the next couple of days. So another rainy day it looks like. And with this, again, we're going to hang on to that humidity and warmer temperatures. So 24 to 25 degrees it looks like for parts of central uh, and then again cooler for the straits but bumping up a couple of degrees 17 degrees for uh, st anthony 12 for cartwright and then those single digit temperatures up through nain as well sitting around seven degrees after this into saturday we are in for a little bit of a cool down some of that upper level uh, temperatures are going to drop down which means we're going to see a cool morning 
four parts Saturday morning and then again on Sunday morning, but it doesn't last long. That cool pool moves out very quickly. We start to see some of that milder air, which is seasonal air for this time of year, and that will push us right into next week. So that also is when we're going to start to see things clear out as a ridge of high pressure moves in. So after we see these uh, above seasonal temperatures dip back down uh, for Saturday night into Sunday for St. John's in eastern Newfoundland and then back to the 20 degree temperatures for Monday, which is again around seasonal for this time of year and it looks like plenty of sunshine. Now for uh, central Newfoundland, same thing, but look at your overnight low Saturday night into Sunday night, uh, dipping down into the low single digits, four degrees by Monday, uh, Monday morning and then 25 degrees. So a big temperature swing there, almost 21 degrees uh, with plenty of sunshine. For Western Newfoundland, 23 degrees, and then there's your dip. Again, Saturday looks wet. Sunday, sunshine returns, and then we're looking at a temperature near 23 degrees for Monday with plenty of sunshine. Now for Eastern Labrador, essentially the exact same trend as we see that cooler air stick around through Saturday, Monday, or Sunday and Monday rather, look absolutely gorgeous, 23, 24 degrees. Now again, keep in mind, this uh, may shift by uh, 12 hours, I would say, these temperature swings. And then for Western Labrador, 21 degrees by Sunday and Monday sitting at 24. So overall, once we get through the next couple of days, as far as this rain goes, the end of the weekend doesn't look too bad. So let's look at your forecast. I'll have your weather photo coming up. Carolyn. Thanks, Ashley. In international news, U.S. President Donald Trump has canceled his trip to Denmark. This after Denmark rejected Trump's suggestion that the U.S. buy Greenland. Today, the Danish Prime Minister had her own response. I've been looking forward um, to the visit. Our preparations were well underway. It was an uh, opportunity, I think, to celebrate uh, Denmark's close uh, relationship to the U.S., and um, uh, uh, who remains one of uh, Denmark's uh, closest allies. Fredrickson says Trump's decision to call off his trip won't affect their partnership, though other Danish leaders have been vocal in their frustrations, saying Denmark should consider fellow European countries as closer allies. Greenland has been gaining attention recently because of its strategic location and natural resources. Well, there were dozens of protesters outside the British consulate in Hong Kong today. They're calling on London to help a consulate staff member who's been detained by China. I want to urge the UK government to step up and act now, save Simon now, okay? China's foreign ministry confirms that Simon Cheng is in custody. His family says he disappeared while traveling to the mainland city nearly two weeks ago. Beijing says the Hong Kong resident violated the law, but a friend says Cheng was not involved in any anti-government demonstrations. His detention could worsen already strained ties between China and the UK. Well, here at home, efforts by the opposition to have Canada's ethics watchdog testify before the ethics committee have been voted down at an emergency meeting of the committee today. I would love to have heard from Mr. Dion about this, but obviously we're not going to be allowed. Well, it's the latest development in the SNC-Lavalin controversy. The opposition called the meeting last week after Prime Minister Justin Trudeau was found to have broken the Conflict of Interest Act by improperly pressuring the former Attorney General. The Ethics Committee has a majority of Liberal members, and the votes ran almost entirely along party lines. Opposition members voted in favor of the motion, while all but one Liberal voted against. Across the country, cities are trying to make roadways safer for pedestrians. But an artist in Nova Scotia wasn't happy with the efforts in his community, so he picked up his paintbrush. CBC's Preston Mulligan has this story from Dartmouth. From this angle, it doesn't look like much, just some black paint on the road. But say you're in your car. When you approach, you start to get the picture. The artist says it'll slow you down. The idea is not only that it's 3D and that it, it makes it look like it's two feet above the ground, but that it pops when somebody's walking across it. Doug Carlton worked early morning hours painting the 3D effect. His approach was, if you ask permission, it'll never happen. I knew they would have said no, and I know it's the sort of thing that you have to see to get. 
A crew is here trying to wash it away. Carlton says he literally stood his ground over his art and the crew left. The plan is to keep painting, add some gray, until it looks more like this crosswalk in Iceland, the country that started the trend. The local councillor here likes it. I've looked around, other cities are trying this, um, other cities are managing to do these sort of innovative things. Canadian cities, yeah, Prince Albert, uh, Saskatchewan, Beaumont, Alberta, and Outremont in Montreal. Austin says whatever guiding principles the city's traffic authority uses to govern crosswalk safety aren't working, and the neighbors agree. Kids are forward thinking, right? And um, a lot of times they tend to take it into their own hands, whatever that means. I think maybe that's what you have there. The city was getting ready to remove the paint, but it decided to give it some more thought. Okay, a spokesperson says a decision will be made in the coming days whether to welcome the new levitating crosswalks. Preston Mulligan, CBC News, Dartmouth. I want to know where you're to. May Baker sent us this lovely photo of a rainbow. I'll tell you where this is too when we come back after the break. Welcome back to Here and Now, everyone. We're going to check in one more time with Ashley uh, to find out where that gorgeous weather photo was taken. Puts me in mind of the Wizard of Oz somewhere over the rainbow. <laughs> <laughs> rainbow. Yes, absolutely. We'll take a look at that uh, photo one more time and uh, let you know where that was taken. So it was actually taken in Mary's Harbor. Nice. <laughs> A beautiful shot there. Yeah, you know, there's one good thing after showers. Uh, sometimes we'll, when that sun comes out, we get those rainbows. I uh, wanted to thank May Baker for that because, uh, I mean, why wouldn't you want to take a photo of a rainbow? Thank you so much for sending that in. If you have any weather photos you'd like to share with us, you can send them to nlphotos at cbc.ca or my Facebook page, which uh, you can post there, and that's CBC 
Ash, Ashley CBC? Yes, Ashley CBC. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess we might have the potential for some rainbows tomorrow with all the rain that's coming our way. Potentially, if that sun peaks out afterwards, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, maybe we'll see that. But um, yeah, the showers will move in for the metro area anyway uh, around the supper hour and then towards the evening hours as well. Well, so, we'll see. Yeah. And uh, it's such a it's such a lovely <laughs> night out there. I hope you're you're going to do something after work now that's uh, very outdoorsy. I should be doing something outdoorsy and taking advantage of this, but uh, I started painting yesterday, so uh, I kind of got to finish that job. <laughs> Indoor painting? I know. Maybe I shouldn't do that. No, scrap it. Scrap it. Do it tomorrow no. when it's raining. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good idea. <laughs> it's definitely a night for a, a nice walk outside. <laughs> yeah, that's a great idea. Maybe I'll do that. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, thanks, everyone, for tuning in tonight. That's uh, here and now for this evening. Enjoy your night.